Okay, so a couple things in really fast because you as good people. Okay, so my plan is to give you the DBQ on Monday. So I'm going to finish up the events that led up to this, and then a lot of you have to give it to yourself. But remember that worksheet, the little packet I gave you? The little, the big packet. By the way, I've gone through them, and some people have to turn this stuff in, so it has been changed to zero. Same with the, uh, the test. So if you got a zero, you better talk to me because there might be a chance to get some of that back. But here, this is um, the third page. Of this is uh, questions for a very short video called Triumph and Despair. And it's World War II in color. It's actual real color footage, a lot of the floss. It's really well done. And it's only about 40 minutes. And so I'd like you to watch that and fill that in. It is, I have the link here over the next couple of days. It's 40 minutes. And some people have already done it, so good for you. And then one more thing. The last page, I wasn't sure if I was going to sign this. And then on a whim, because it is off, it's that, the actual one before the last page. It's called Total War. It's the it's a this World War II color. This one is a three-part series, so it's the second one, and I have a link to it here. If you watch that, and so then I'll give you extra credit. It's it's amazing. But let me warn you one thing about Triumph and Despair and Total War. It has a little bit about the ghettos, how ghettos were. All that basically means it's not an isolated part of a village, but that's where Jews were put in in occupied areas, and it has some of that, and it's disturbing. But then it has the the liberation of the concentration. And they're all written about concentration camps. These aren't the footage of the Jap camps. The Russians, the Soviets liberated those. But these are like Buchenwald and Buchenwald, Scott Howe, I think Bergen Belson. Yes. Oh, that's so that was a chance for extra credit. It's very good. And oh, I also have, I just found an opportunity for a, a chance for a scholarship next year. Did you know that? Um, College is expensive. I don't know if you guys knew that. But there's a chance for a scholarship, and it's the write an essay for the League of Women Voters. And I, I literally just got the information. Yeah. And some of, I know some other teachers have gotten it, but uh, and told you about it. I just got it today. And I do like to give you a lot of opportunities. So I will post that online. If you've already got another class, that's great. But I just post it on uh, the post for next month. Sound good? So just have to look at, I mean, it's a, it's a one page essay, so you, know, you can, that's not a lot. That's a, that's a, a it's kind of nice. That's not like 20 pages. All right, so where are we at? Did we get to um, Frankenstein? No. We haven't got the Frankenstein. Okay, so imagine a castle. How many square feet is that? Six. About three. By the way, I love castles. And we should all take a bus ride through Wales and watch and look at castles. Greatest castles in the world are in Wales. For bad reasons, but the castles are still really cool. What's your all-time favorite castle? Harley. Wow. You went off the top of your head. Yeah, Harley Castle in Wales. It's so un it's so cool, I can't even describe how cool it is. So we got to hear. Yeah. Munich equals impeachment. We got that, right? Yeah. And then we got to today. And I'll do it. It's Munich! We can't allow this out because of Munich. In fact, I remember somebody talking about we can't sign a, a, an agreement to, uh, with Iran about nuclear weapons, about them building nuclear weapons, because it'll be just like Munich. And it was actually really funny because the interviewer said, well, so what happened in Munich? They had no idea. They just had a piece of paper say Munich. And, but the big thing about this is every situation is different. So there is a rule to learn from Munich. Don't trust Hitler, right? You can write that down. Don't trust him. If Hitler comes up with the idea, with the deal, check the wall. Don't trust him. I've learned over the years to not trust Hitler. <laughs> it doesn't mean appeasement is good or bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not making that judgment. I'm just saying that things are more complex. We can learn from history, but it's not all the same. Yeah. I, I still think it's kind of silly that. Like all his trust in the one piece of paper. 
it, it shows you their absolute desperation. Yeah, it does. You know, they, these are all people who remember the song. Yeah. You know, they remember Verdun. It's sad. Mm -hmm. I understand why. So, and Hitler proved to be, this might grab your desk, shocking re revelation, he was lying. And he took the rest of Czechoslovakia in March of 1939. I should add that uh, you know, Czechoslovakia absolutely abandoned, disillusioned, the government began to collapse, and that's why it fell relatively quick. And they would absorb it into the greater German Reich. Uh, Slovakia, that's uh, a long story, I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but... Between the Munich Agreement, though, and the taking of the rest of Czechoslovakia, the realization across Europe, but especially Germany, is war is imminent. Hitler wanted war, even though the army was not ready. And this is going to trigger Kristallnacht, which in English means the night of the broken glass. And that was November 9th through, okay, for some reason I put a hyphen there, but that's also the Jeez, I never really looked at it. Let's see if I put a hyphen. But, and this was the last of the efforts that began with the Nuremberg Law to force the remaining Jews to leave Germany. And it was triggered by a German diplomat was murdered in Paris by a, uh, uh, the assassin was Jewish. And so this, said, oh, this shows the, the evil of Jews and how they're going to try to destroy the country. And this would trigger what we call a pogrom, a mass attack all over Germany. The government was not directly involved, but they clearly aided in it all that night. And this was to drive Jews out before war. A new war was coming. And the thought was, we have to get this group out. Because once war begins, the borders are shut down. And you can't force people out. And so, so many shop windows were, destroyed, were broken of the remaining stores owned by Jews. That's the night of the broken glass. Uh, it's complex how they did it. They had German owners. Here's a synagogue in Berlin burning. Hundreds of Jews would be injured. A couple would be murdered. And it would be justified their murder because good Germans had no choice but to attack Jews. The Jews instigated this by being Jewish. And many Jewish leaders, to, to also to increase the terror, were put into protective custody for their own safety because good Germans would have no choice but to kill them. When I mean protective custody, I mean those concentration camps. And yeah, of course, this is garbage. You know, I'm just telling you what they said. This is pure garbage. They were just using this to try to force Jews out. Many fled, but where could they go? The U.S. would not take them. In fact, turned away a boat called the SS St. Louis filled with 300 Jewish. Uh, German Jews were trying to flee after this. The U.S. turned it away, and it ended up going to Poland. And here's Hitler looking at the some of the destruction. All these dots are German cities where it happened. You know, they've now annexed this, and that's the Sudeten line. So, one story about this. So, my brother married uh, my brother's. Um, his first wife, you know, stuff happens, but she was Jewish, so my niece and nephew were first, first Jewish, but um, they came, when they first came out, this is 30 years ago, and they came to see, um, you know, in, even though for, Jew, for Jews, Christmas is always curious uh, for them, but they came, uh, because everyone gets it off in the United States, they came to my uh, city to visit my parents when I was there, and um, my parents took him to the, my parents went to the Congregational Church. We went to the Congregational Church and they did Christmas hymns. And they sang uh, Silent Night. And that, she never believed what the song was. I was here. And her first thought was, Crystal Night. Silent Night. Yeah. In the German had the title, Silent, Silent Night. And that was the first thing she thought of it. It really bothered her, just triggered a reaction. That I I knew it. I knew about it. I knew it. I knew what happened. I understood, kind of thought I understood it, but it wasn't personal. Then I understood it. I'm talking to my nephew, who's a sophomore at Ohio State now. Similar thing happened to him 
um, Bishop, just because he just has a different point of view. So that was a curious thing for me. So this is all on the edge of the beginning of World War II. Now, some have argued that World War II began in 31 or 37. Uh, we're going to stick with the formal date because the actual starting date, whatever. We know about the events leading up to it. But going into that summer of 39, it looked like war was imminent. Hitler wanted war, even though his generals weren't scared. There's even thought of a coup to overthrow him. That's another one of those great what ifs in history. But the Polish corridor would be the next part. This finger of line here, and these green dots here, that is Jew, a German majority populations. And the, so there were ethnic Germans inside Poland. So he did the same thing he did in the Sudeten line. Ethnic Germans are being mistreated, and he threatened Poland. Britain and France this time said, we will defend Poland. So you can imagine Hitler thought about that. Yeah, right. I'll keep pushing. They don't really mean it. They actually did. And um, And Poland actually had a nasty dictatorship, unlike the democracy in Czechoslovakia. But German, this time Britain and France, meant it. Hitler, though, attacked anyways. The problem for Hitler, though, he remembered World War I when they fought a two-front war. And the Soviet Union and France were talking an alliance game again. But nobody really trusted Stalin. So Hitler is thinking, how do I avoid a two-front war? Because if they do attack, then he's have to fight them. What if the Soviets come? And Stalin, and don't forget, the mortal enemy of Nazi Germany is the communists and the Soviet Union. The mortal enemy of the Soviet Union, the fascists. They hate each other, supposedly. But let's be clear about it. These are dictators and opportunistic people. The Soviets, Stalin, had committed one of the gravest crimes against humanity. Well, actually, the purges in Europe had not been a great crime. That's another story. But by industrializing, industrializing the, the Soviet Union and creating collective farms, they had actually, in the process, created a famine that killed tens of millions of people. And at that time, they were involved in what's called the purges and the tear, where Stalin was ridding the country of any potential enemy. Who was a potential enemy? Anybody who had power. Stalin was, without a doubt, the most paranoid person ever. And I said, how could you say that? Well, oh, Stalin, yeah, it works. Brilliant man, hardworking man, evil man, paranoid man. So anybody who had power, and that included the officers in the army. He had the head of the, the Red Army arrested and executed, and 60% of the officers would be arrested, most would be executed. Every single leading Bolshevik was threatened. Most of those Bolsheviks who started the revolution back in 1917, if they were still alive in, in the 1930s, they died in a natural cause, tortured or shot by the Soviet Union. So if you have 60% of the officers now gone, by the way, using the dark humor of Russia, they got the nine millimeter headache. And the head of the secret police, the Czechos, which would have after the war become the KGB, he kept the bullets and wrote the name of everybody they killed. Those bullets still exist in the archives of Moscow. And then Yogoda was enough for Stalin. He'd be replaced in war. And eventually bury him. But both of them. But his successors would get a bullet with Yogoda. So the thing about Stalin was, if you kill 60% of your officers, by the way, the remaining officers are really loyal, but there's some problems in the army at that moment. He doesn't trust Britain or France, and the impossible happened. They formed a non-aggression attack. Not quite an alliance. Yes, CB marriage. I think that was funny. I really like this one with pistols behind their backs. One of them is going to betray the other. But both of them, for very cynical reasons, declared an alliance, which, by the way, sent shockwaves throughout the world. This destroyed these um, small but active communist parties across Western Europe and the U.S. Basically, you're, you said Hitler was a threat. Now you're, what? But what they got, they agreed in secret to split Poland in two. And they're going to trade. What will they trade? German technology for what they needed to fight a modern war. They didn't have oil. 
The Soviets would give them their oil. Well, by the way, this graded on Hitler. The Soviets would give them their oil. This graded on Hitler. And by the way, that's why this is such a good cartoon. See, you know, that, they see the oil well from the distance. That's so clever. That's well done. So with that, but also the Soviets could expand. They could take Poland, the Baltic states, and they would attack, not do very well, but eventually take part of, part of Finland too. Stalin did this to try to reestablish the old Russian Empire. Hitler took it. But both of them are planning on when they're going to stab the other in the back. So now with Hitler knowing the Soviets are in it, he doesn't worry about the Soviets. The French are still a massive threat, but he invaded Poland. That's the headline from uh, the Evening Standard, the lunchtime edition in, in London. The date, September 1st, 1939. Now, the Polish army was actually very powerful in the 1920s, but they had, had been uh, destabilized, uh, um, and lost a lot of power during the 1930s with their, with their dictatorship. He didn't, uh, Kudelinski, the dictator, did not want the Polish army to get too strong. And now the Germans, remember what I told you, over 90% of their transport was still horse strong. But what the Germans did, though, is they took their tanks and all their motorized vehicles, and they didn't have very good tanks. They had light armor, a lot of problems with it. But they focused them all in four big what they call the Panzer Corps. Corps. Here, 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 and here. And so at one point, they're really strong. And they would use that to burst through and encircle. Burst through and encircle. It's not new tactics. That's what the Germans did back in 1918. But it seemed different because of the new weapons. So they get overwhelmed at the spot. The name the Germans gave this was Blitzkrieg, which means lightning war. It's not revolutionary new tactics, but the other armies are still thinking we're fighting like World War I. And so this was revolutionary, and it hid the German army's deficiencies. Boy, would they be exposed in the Soviet Union. And so with that, and then Polish army, not prepared for that, would be, be driven back. But Britain and France did declare war. And then what did Britain and France do? Nothing. They decided World War I, we won, and we figured out how to fight this war because the Germans attacked and beat their head against our defenses until we could defeat them. So we'll just do the same thing. So with that, the Soviets attacked two weeks later in Poland. The Soviets attacked, the both totalitarian dictators brutally mistreated Poland. Uh, in fact, Stalin would order the execution of 60,000 Polish officers who were taken prisoner. And what the Germans would do would be one of the one of the crimes against humanity that's indescribable what's going to happen to Poland. No country suffered more than Poland. In recent European part of World War II. Poor Poland. But when they fell, nothing happened in the West. And for six months, the British, the small British army, the huge, very powerful French army, but really poorly led, faced off against the German army that was trying to organize. So here's French forces. These are British forces. In fact, that's the uh, um, King of Belgium, actually. But, and this was dubbed the Phony War. But very quickly, it would be by jokers in Britain. Blitzkrieg would become Sitzkrieg, as no one did anything. But German propaganda really played a Blitzkrieg fight. We reinvented war! And people were scared. They thought Germany was significantly more powerful than what they actually were. By the way, what a big advantage, huh? So the French never understood their superiority, for example, in tanks. They just they didn't understand it. 
And they were so scared. They, they had terrible communications, a bunch of problems. Since Craig would be broken, oh, almost forgot. So the French had built an incredibly elaborate and sunk millions of francs into this elaborate fortification named after their foreign minister or their defense minister, the Maginot Line. And the Maginot Line were a series of forts on the high ground from Switzerland, then really powerful forts all the way to the Luxembourg border. So the German-French order will be completely closed off. So if the Germans are going to attack, they'll have to attack through Belgium again. By the way, what was that plan from World War One? where they attacked through Belgium? You remember that plan? The German attack in World War One? The Schlieffen plan. Does that sound familiar? That's what they thought they had to do. In fact, that was the German plan. They were changing. So they built this elaborate fortification. Do you see this right here? It's this little national that didn't exist. They didn't defend the Ardennes force because it was heavily forced in the mountains. They figured no one would attack there, so they put their worst forces here. And then the French plan put their best and the British best in here and stopped the Germans in Belgium. Not a bad plan if the Germans would just do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and if you ever go to France and get a chance to go to the Maginot Line, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I went into a fort near the, the Luxembourg border, and it wow. You can see why they thought they were um, invulnerable. They're all underground in these mountains, so they have turrets that will pop up, massive cement bunkers on every defended spot. Every Any spot of defense has guns covering it. They have little railroads, drawing little electric railroads, see the tracks right there, to whisk troops all over the front. They have ferries to hold thousands of men. It's incredible. As long as the Germans don't try to go around it through force, it's not defended. That's what we call foreshadowing. They even had the high ground. Huh? It should have been over. They had the high ground. If you went there, you could go, wow, there's no way they could. So, in April of 1940, Sitzkrieg was broken when Germany attacked Norway and Denmark. To protect their northern flank, and they were also getting uh, iron from Sweden, so to protect that, Sweden remained neutral. I don't know how they did, but somehow they did. The British and French tried to stop them, but they were defeated, kind of humiliated there. Norway would fall. Denmark would fall. I like this one, Shane. You know, here's the Western Front, all the armed German defensive line, the French defensive line. Here's the God of War. Oh, we just shoot Scandinavia. That's a bitter, dark, but also clever cartoon. But that would be a wake-up call. And a, less than a month after that, the main German attack. And part one of World War II, the Battle of France. And May 10th, and it lasted less than a month and a half. Remember, Hitler fought on the Western Front and part of the losing army on the Western Front. So the thought was they got to knock the French out. Remember, though, Hitler's plan, knock the French out so we could take care of the evil, evil communists. Does that make sense? This is a foreshadowing moment. That's the Arc of Triumph. So I think he gets what's going to happen. This should not have happened. The French army should not have lost. So one of the best books I've read about this has the great name, Strange Victories. Because it should not have happened. And the French have not recovered from this. But here's the way the battle line looked. And Germany, when they actually were forced to change their plan, and none of the officers thought it would work, but Hitler stuck with it. But their best force is here. And they would drive through the forest and then break out. The best British and French forces would advance into the in Belgium to stop them there, leaving this hole. And then the Germans came up with a master plan. When they broke through, they figured they, they knew the French would think, okay, they're going to try to go over Paris. No. Does anybody know what they did? They turned back. And surrounded the best French and British forces. It's a good plan. They would use the very good French roads to just drive their tanks as fast as possible. Now, there would be supply issues, but they did have one advantage. The tanks had petrol, gasoline engines, and that's bad for a tank. I think you probably guess why. One spark. 
But what's the good thing about it? When they drove through France, the German tanks, they just stopped at French gas stations and fueled up. <laughs> no, they did not pay. So with that, and on May 14, 50, they broke through. This is a place called Sedan. It's a beautiful place in the forest. They broke through. So here are the German tanks. Uh, they got into the clear open area of northern France and totally took the French by surprise. French communication has been so bad that the, one of the biggest tank battles in history would take place right here between French and German tanks, and the French didn't realize they won. That's how bad their communication is. So, the Germans broke through and advanced to the sea. Before the best forces in Brit the, Brit the British and French forces could realize it, they were stuck on a diversionary attack. Ironically, on the same day the Battle of France began, Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, was fired. Well, he lost a vote of confidence because of what happened in Norway. So there's Chamberlain out there. There's Chamberlain with, with that piece of paper, peace in our, at our time. He was fired. And somebody who was actually really unpopular, nobody, nobody trusted him, but he, um, nobody trusted this politician, but he had forecast Hitler's aggression would become Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Nobody trusted him. There's, whoa. there's Churchill right here. By the way, if you turn the beat sign the other way, that is the equivalent of flipping somebody off in Britain. So please don't turn that around. <laughs> yeah, this is fine. Other way back. I know what you're telling <laughs> So he, now, he was, uh, had all kinds of weird plans, weird ideas, made a lot of mistakes. But for a few months here, Winston Churchill saved the Western civilization. Winston Churchill. And uh, I have mixed feelings about Churchill, but as a character, I really like him. As him as a leader, whoo, he had some bad ideas. But he decided, angering the French, to pull him out. The British had the bulk of their best forces in Belgium, and he's going to pull them out. And Hitler would help him. Hitler would help. They retreated to a tiny little harbor right here called Dunkirk, which is nothing more than just a few piers. And Hitler had arrived here, right around the coast, his Panzer tank unit. Hitler also couldn't believe me that they did that well. And he ordered his tanks to stop and refit. If they would have aggressively moved and cut off the coastline, the, almost all the British forces would have to surrender, and it's hard to imagine Britain staying in the war. And history would be totally different. But they gave a chance for British and French forces to form a loop around Dunkirk. They got every ship they could find. Every boat, every fishing boat, you name it, piloted by Royal Navy Reservists. If you watch the movie Dunkirk, which is a pretty good movie, even though it has, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah. uh, they have civilians piloting them. No, that's a myth. But it's good for a movie, so what they have, right? And they evacuated the first week of July, or June, I'm sorry, and pulled out over 250,000 British forces. They thought they would be lucky to get uh, 40,000. And another nearly 100,000 French forces. Of course, the poor French, they'd be sent back to fight the last battle to be caught there. But they also want to go home, I don't blame them. But here they are going to the sea. Here they are shooting at German um, airplanes, the Luftwaffe attacking them. And they made it. Most of the harbor was quickly destroyed. Little fishing boats came out to get them, see the little boats picking them up off the shore. This is in the British War Museum. This boat's the smallest one. I took this picture, and it can literally we can fit about seven of those in this classroom. <laughs> you sailed that across the channel? You ever see the English Channel? It is rough. It's rough seas. I mean, it's it's rougher than can bear. But with that, the thing is, the always the joke was they escaped with only their lives. They, none of their equipment they're able to get across. But when they save these forces, Britain could stay in the war. In fact, it's a horrible defeat, but Britain could kind of turn it into a propaganda victory. 
We saved our men. It's a horrible defeat, humiliating defeat. If they would have got 20,000 men across and that's it, they would have had to sue for peace. Probably give up something and hopefully Germany would quit. But now they got that 19 miles of English Channel, they'll be safe. What if France, early June, the Germans began their last offensive. France, French morale was, morale was in the tank, the government collapsed. Uh, they, they were furious that Britain abandoned them, and they fell incredibly fast. It's shocking considering how good their army was, but also World War I. This is one of the most famous shot French soldier they fought back in a German. Uh, this is actually, he's a motorcycle soldier, but he's walking. Don't ask why. But uh, the motorcycle must have got blown up. But looking back, and here are colonial French soldiers that surrender. This still shocked everybody. Italy, Mussolini did, did not want to join the war. But when he saw France falling, he thought, well, I'm going to join them and get my peace. And that was spelled the doom of Mussolini. Here they are attacking the Alps. And even though this is way earlier, I decided to show you a picture of Mussolini with a lion cub because, of course. And so with that, France surrendered. Armistice on the 22nd, formal surrender on the 25th, in the same rail car as World War I. Here's Hitler gleefully stomping his foot afterwards. And humiliating defeat, and the assumption was it's over. And now we can turn on the Soviets. But, oh, here's the surrender. This is a famous picture of a French civilian. Hitler did spend a half day in Paris, gleefully going like a tourist. I finally won after World War I. Vichy France would become southern France, and it was technically independent. So the area of blue right there, Vichy was a little, uh, a little resort town, famous for their water, for bottled water. But uh, March of the Ton, a World War I hero, would lead the government that collaborated with the Germans. The red part was occupied, and this would be up until uh, end of 42. And so they would collaborate with German occupation, and after the summer of 42, with the final solution. France has never dealt with it. How do you deal with the government of traitors? It's a hard one, isn't it? What do you do with the traitors? Especially when a lot of them, like, they had no choice or they would be shot. How do you deal with that? France didn't, I know we, the U.S. hadn't done a good job in this, and it's civil war. So Britain's alone. And Churchill, though, now stay in the Bible. He vowed Germany, or um, Hitler just assumed they would come up with some kind of peace agreement. Britain will really quit fighting, and now they can turn on the Soviet Union. And you know, Churchill was very bombastic, but Hitler just thought that was a, you know, play out. No. Okay, Churchill, they actually did kind of look for a way to get out of the war and decided they can't trust him. They still nearly lost. Hitler threatened invasion, but there's no way they could get across the channel. They had no real navy. So with that, we're beginning, okay, the Germans never called it this, but we call it this today. The effort to finally get Britain to sue for peace called the Battle of Britain. This gift of the sue for peace. And even though the bombing would go on until the spring of 1941, the main fighting was from August to October of 40. And so Hitler's plan, turn on the Soviet Union, but knock them out. So what did he do? He had his air force. The plan was the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, knock out the Royal Air Force, the RAF. Knock them out. Hit their bases, hit the factories. And what's attrition? Remember, kill so many of them. Kill so many pilots. Destroy so many planes. Make sure they can't produce more planes. So they have to quit. So here are German Stuka bombers who tried to be very vulnerable. The German Air Force was not built for this. They didn't have very good bombers. But it almost worked. But the RAF, the Royal Air Force, fought better than anyone thought. But they had a big technological advantage. Anybody know what that was? Yeah. The Germans totally underestimated the power of radar. Totally underestimated. Radar, which was originally designed to 
do weather or meteorology, always warn the British where the big German attack was coming. So they could have fighters there to pick them off. Radar would be key. The Germans had run most of their scientists out, so they were way behind. So here are German or British uh, pilots scrambling to their planes as a hurricane. They had two really good fighter planes, Hurricane and Spitfire. A couple of flaws with it, but a good, really good plane. And they begin to knock out a lot of German planes. Hitler got impatient. There was a shot Germany could knock out the RAF. But instead, Hitler changed tactics because he wanted to punish the, the British to what the British would call the Blitz. What's the Blitz? Terror bombing of London. All right, we'll kill so many British civilians, make them suffer that they will blame Churchill for not protecting them and knock them, and knock them out of the war. Remember total war. Total war is a take to the war to the enemy so they overthrow their government. That's a German Heiko bomber over London. That's the temp. That's a pretty amazing picture. Did it work? No. It was an absolute failure. With pressure off, the RAF survived, and therefore Britain could survive. And with that, the civilians of British cities, especially London, but also uh, Coventry, Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, they would suffer greatly. 43,000 would be killed, 139,000 would be left homeless, but they survived. They survived. The Germans quickly adopted night bombing because they're losing too many planes. And night bombing, they couldn't hit anything. So what did they aim for? They went, they went to blackouts. So they couldn't find lights. They just would target off residential areas. The first plane would come drop a cinderic bomb that would create fires, and then they bomb the bombs. This is mass slaughter. Did it work? Okay, the British civilians saw it. But did they blame Churchill? No. Who did they blame? The Germans. And what did they want? The Germans. And what's going to happen to the Germans? In one night in 1943, British bombers would bomb Hamburg and kill over 43 men. In one night. They're going to come after their civilians. By the way, did that keep Germany to surrender? No. Total war doesn't quite work, but everybody adopts the hells of it. Why? Because they don't know what else to do. So here are German civilian or British civilians in the subway. Uh, uh, St. Um, Paul's Cathedral, the U.S. Capitol, completely copied it. Survived bombing all around it, but it somehow survived. It's a really sad picture. Bombed out of her home. Saved the cap. Well, while this is going on, Germany attacked Yugoslavia in Greece, partially to bail out the Italians. But this is all setting up for Hitler's big attack and fatal, biggest fatal mistake. With Britain still in the war, remember Dunkirk? Who did Hitler order his generals to prepare to attack? Operation Barbarossa invade the Soviet Union. And it's going to be on the longest night of the year. So they have, hopefully the Russian uh, dirt roads would have dried out. They could attack. And remember, Lehman's wrong. His fear of the communists. By the way, you like the knife in the back. Oh, one of them was going to betray the other. This was going to be a massive attack. The numbers were relatively even, but the Soviet Union is a huge country with a bigger population than Germany. And they were becoming very industrialized. This is greater Germany, by the way. They wanted that land. But the big thing they wanted was oil. Now, the Soviets are going to quit trading oil with Germany with Germany in I don't know if you know that about the war, but that usually ends trade. But Hitler didn't like to be dependent on it, so he wanted the oil. Where was the oil? That's over a thousand miles from where the Germans are on bad roads. 
and the Germans and the Russians aren't going to let them have the nice rail network that the Soviets have built. So the big plan, a three-pronged attack, Moscow's the key, but also Leningrad, and then here's where the oil is, resources. A three-pronged attack. But Germany didn't have enough forces. And you might notice, think about the Soviet Union, you notice it's like a funnel, <laughs> it gets bigger. It's going to be really hard to take the Soviet Union. But everybody thought, including both Britain and the United States, that Stalin would last no more than six weeks. Everybody thought that. You know who else thought that? The German army and Hitler. They thought they were invincible after beating France. So what happened with this? Oh, one more thing. The British warned Stalin. They didn't like Stalin, but the enemy of my enemy will become my friend. And they had broken the German code. The Germans were using a code, uh, a decode, uh, an encoding machine called the Enigma machine. And in a place called Benchley Park, which was an old country estate, their code breakers were breaking not the complete German code, but they knew what was going on. Remember, they did the same thing in World War I. Remember the Zimmerman note? The Germans didn't figure it out. The Poles are the one who actually got it for them. They warned Stalin, but Stalin refused to agree. He refused to believe it. Take his own spies told him, Germans are coming. Why did Stalin refuse to agree? He didn't think Hitler was that crazy. Britain was still fighting. No way he would do it. No, Hitler was that much of an ideologue. I should add that every Soviet spy that tried to tell Stalin, tried to send word back that Hitler was going to attack and he ignored, what happened to them? They were disappeared. So, the attack happened was a total surprise. Here are more propaganda photos of the attack, that famous shot of the potato masher grenade getting across the Russian planes. And the Soviets were taken by surprise. 60% of their planes in the western part of the Soviet Union were destroyed on the ground. The Germans broke through and they formed massive encirclements. At midst, 300,000 Soviets were surrounded. You don't need to know the numbers, I'm just telling you. It's a big, big. Smolensk, 500,000. At Kiev, Almost a million Soviet troops are surrounded. And Hitler just like, no way the Soviets could take these kind of defeats. Well, they somehow did. Which, by the way, you can start seeing the beginning of the Cold War right there. The Soviets withstood the best army, at least everyone thought one, the best army in the world. They took those losses, turned around, beat them decisively. What could they do to us? We even have a chance against them? You can see the beginnings of the Cold War right there. U.S. fears of that. Behind the lines were Einsatz Group, special detachments of the SS. They did the same thing in Poland. And they were going to get rid of undesirables, like uh, political leaders, teachers who lined up and shot immediately, but shooters. And tens of thousands would be shot by the SS and the regular army's help. They would deny this after the war. It's a kind of a German myth. It was the bad Nazis and knocks up, not us. Sorry, the Germans did it too. Just like the US can't escape slavery, the Germans can't escape what they did either. And on that happy note, it's going to be in the upper 60s tomorrow. And then two inches of rain on Sunday. But we need the rain. We need the rain. <laughs> See you Monday. Have a good weekend. Wherever you find work, and hang by your thumbs. Yes. Yeah, the guy that they sent. It's on a dead body. Yeah. Uh, oh God, I know the name of this. It'll come to me in a sec, but I know the the, the program. Operation Barbo, I think. But yeah, it's a good story. The British were great at those kind of things. And just everything. Is it this one I read that was back then early? Because that one's Duke. That's too much. Just keep it doing it.
So I'll go through a little more detail than the rest is all yours. So everything from Pearl Harbor on is all yours. Ah, you get to know it. Yeah. I think you have that skill set. Go! Goodbye, everybody.